As a consequence of several factors in 2000, late 2002, a new organization, 3A Sanitary Standards, was incorporated. All of those activities were handed over to this new independent organization that now works at arm's length from all of the individual stakeholder groups. So we are responsible now for the oversight of the TPV inspection program, which is a very, very critical part of the 3A symbol licensing program. And of course, one of the most visible, one of the most important uh, parts of 3A is this third party verification inspection program. In this day and age, it's hard to go anywhere in the course of a day and not bump into some kind of requirement uh, for somebody doing something for you, but they've got to hold a third party verification or a credential in order to perform that service. And I think in the food industry, it's going to become even more important that credible third party inspection agents are going to play a more important role going forward to work in a complementary fashion with the folks whose jobs are on the front line inspecting this equipment. But the TPV for us certainly brings added assurance that the equipment or the systems that show the symbol do in fact conform in all particulars to the, the three sanitary standards that's referenced. That inspection has to be done. It can only be done by someone credentialed by us who's called a Certified Conformance Evaluator, or a CCE. And the actual uh, contracting of the work by that CCE is done independent of 3A by the fabricator or the licensee. So we work in arm's length. The CCEs serve as independent contractors with the licensee, the, the party that wishes to use the simple. And again, I'm going to defer to the later speaker to describe what the requirements and the qualifications of a CCE actually are. In order to prepare for an evaluation, the CCE has a certain cadre of components and diagrams, documents, reference uh, information, and what I'd like to do is explain each of these and, and what it really means to us. On the 3A website, we have the TPV manual. This is the guidance for the program. It provides the step-by-step -step mechanisms that a conformance evaluator needs to follow and also provides a lot of guidance to the industry. Within the TPV manual, we also are provided something that's called the CCE checklist. The checklist itself is a series of six very basic questions. And those questions, just to give you a quick overview, are is the standard number displayed along with the symbol? Is there a series of manuals for the piece of equipment? Is there an engineering design and technical construction file? Because part of the TPV manual requires the evaluator review this file. Is there a copy of the current 3A standard on file? And generally, that's a component of the EDTCF. Have we verified the quality program? In other words, does this manufacturer have procedures in place that let us know if we're looking at item one, that item 5,000 will be just like item one with respect to the quality and conformity to the standard? Then we have a limited number of material certifications. We have rubber and rubber-like materials, and in those cases, they're conforming to 3A standard 18. Part of this standard is automatically including a reference to 21 CFR 177, 2600. But standard 18 takes that a step further and provides then the environmental of, of use checks in caustic, in butter fat, in water solution. So we're checking porosity and weight gain. Plastics or polymeric materials that are uh, other than rubber. So in those cases, we're conforming to 3A standard 20. Standard 20 automatically includes a 21 CFR 177 reference, although 177 has a long list of plastics. So we can always reference the fact that in the standard 20, is a rather uh, comprehensive list of plastics that we know about, and each of the references or revisions, I should say, that are created 
are generally adding another material to the table in the standard. And then, at that point, we're ready to get beyond the basic checklist. My methodology is I use that checklist to take a standard, create a question for each paragraph, and, and that's my way of performing the evaluation. In this regard, we take a copy of the document and the evaluator marks or initials each paragraph. So this dovetails with the checklist that we've just created and th this indicates that the evaluator has looked at each paragraph, understands the content, looks at the equipment, and has similarly determined yes, no, or not applicable. But we want to mark the standard so it's clear that anyone referencing this file in the future has no misconceptions as to what we looked at. We have a series of documents that we're referencing as guidance bulletins. And the CCE guidance bulletins are also listed on the 3A website. They're accessible to all of you. There are some topics that deserve sharing with all of the CCEs. Or, for example, when we encounter a topic uh, where we try to develop a way of evaluating these materials and creating a very level playing field for all of the evaluators to use the same basis. And this is the standardization, if you will, of the program. And then lastly, there might be other reference standards. I've already mentioned 18 and 20 for the materials. There might be a reference to standard 63 for fittings. Uh, perhaps it's a very complex filler. It may involve valves. It may involve pumps. So all these other supporting standards, we want to also have that. So as a, as a rule, any other reference standards, we want to bring along. Then we have a certain handful of equipment, not very complex, mercifully, a flashlight, a tape measure, a gripping device. But most importantly, we also have some other rather specialized components a series of surface quality. In this case, we have a digital profilometer. This device has a small garnet stylus. And as this drags across the surface, it's going to give us a digital reading of the surface roughness. In this case, we have it set to give us a surface roughness average. Our baseline, typically within 3A, is a 32 RA, 32 micro inch RA, or 0 0.8 micrometer, sometimes referred to as micron RA. So having a device that can physically measure the surface of a piece of equipment is critical. Also, radius gauges. Just nothing more than shapes that we can mate to a surface and compare the inspected piece of equipment to the label on the radius gauge. And then lastly, maybe a, in this case, I use a small instrument screwdriver to help pry out an O-ring out of a groove so we can again verify the radii. Then the fabricator needs to bring something to the table. And in this case, I've only listed one thing. It's the engineering design and technical construction file. And ideally, this one document should contain all of the rest of the documents that they, they need to help us with. Most important is the table of contents. If for cause this file needs to be inspected by the regulatory community, most often having a table of contents will let you know what's in this file, it's, a, it's an easy way to communicate with a fabricator, and we want to try to make this uh, process go as quickly as possible. So I always provide encouragement that the fabricator develop and maintain a table of contents. We also, in this case, would have instruction manuals. Any manuals or owner's guides, in this case, instruction and maintenance for this particular pump. And within that manual, we're looking for 
rather specific guidance later in the evaluation. As we also are looking for an example of the nameplate, part of the use and display rules of the 3A symbol is that we display not only the graphic 3A symbol, but adjacent to that, we also want to mark the standard number. And then lastly, material certifications. Bill of materials. We're looking for an understanding of the components within a piece of equipment and again, we want to verify that each of those combinations that's available is in some way listed on a bill of materials so we can dig a little deeper and make sure that these materials will conform. And a copy of the applicable standards, not just the pump, but remember we also have rubber and plastics, we have fittings, we maybe have other components that are part of the device for which there's an existing standard. Also, we want to verify that if there are uh, written quality program documents, we'd like to at least see the reference. Many times the quality system manuals are quite involved. All we want to do, if nothing else, within that table of contents, we would like them to list where a person could go within a company's system to find documents. And then finally, the drawings showing all product contact surfaces. Here again, we're looking for the material itself, the radii, the surface finish, those that have direct bearing on the product itself. It's also, though, important to know that this file can be the repository or the storage location for supporting test data. In this case, we have a report from a major university that is their validation for cleanability. This is part of the supporting document that's also referenced in the standard. We want to know that within their system, the quality control and the quality assurance process documents change control, and also this allows the evaluator to determine if there was a bearing on conformity to the standard and if so, where we really need to look for the additional details. And then lastly, it's also a great spot to store prior authorization certificates, prior copies of applications, and any historical communication with 3A SSI. I think without being too redundant, you're going to see all, all of the features that Tracy went through in the model document. We have the scope. We have applicable definitions. As you can see, the fabrication area is, is very detailed and includes a lot of the specialty aspects that we'll be covering in the actual fabrication uh, evaluation. So with this, I think the key first steps are we have a pump in front of us. And the first thing that we need to do is really disassemble this pump. In this case, we're not going to remove the pump shaft from the adapter. We're going to remove the impeller, the mechanical seal, the cover plate, and this, in essence, will give us access to all of the product contact surfaces. So the first step, we'll be removing the cover plate And now, we'll be ready to remove the impeller assembly. And obviously, I've loosened this already. And I'm perhaps remiss in saying that in this case, this impeller retaining nut, I could also visibly see the seal was visible.